All right, gonna be sharing my travel photography and videography process since there has been some requests for it and it's particularly fitting because we're doing the whole nomadic thing right now, so. Here we go. Number one is a research. I know it's boring, but it's gonna save you a lot of time and it's gonna give you some inspiration. Generally, I just type the location I'm at plus photography on Google and there'll be a ton of blog posts and a ton of tips that will pop up. And that's the great thing because most of the research has already been done for you and for me. For example, I was in London and I just typed in London photography and I just compiled a list of places that I thought look cool to go shoot. And I'll also try to map it out on Google Maps so I can open up my phone and navigate to that spot right away. One website that I recently discovered is locationscout.com. I don't know how fleshed out it is, but I used it for the first time while I was in London and it gave me the exact coordinates that I need to go to to get all of my shots. Since I'm not a native to London, it was incredibly helpful. Number two, sunrise and sunset are the best time to shoot. So it doesn't matter what your camera is. It could be a phone, it could be an APS-C camera, it could be a full frame camera. At the end of the day, or at the start of the day, lighting is key and it can make or break your shot. I typically don't bother shooting in harsh lighting conditions. I would like to improve on that someday, but as of now, I just find a cool indoor place to go shoot at, or if I woke up early for sunrise that day, I would come back to the Airbnb, take a nap, recharge, and go back out during sunset to shoot. Yes, I know waking up early sucks. No one wants to do it. I don't want to do it. But that's the beauty of it because not a lot of people wants to wake up to go get the shot, right? Early bird gets the worm. So you show up, you get some bangers and you'll feel good for the rest of the day. Now, obviously sunset is a lot easier to shoot, but then you would have to deal with a flood of people. What about low light and night photography? So I love doing long exposure. It's like the easiest thing to do. I just plop my camera down on a mini tripod, set my ISO to 100 F9 aperture, and go down on my shutter until I get a zero zero reading on my exposure. Then I put the camera to self timer for about two to five seconds, and just let it rip. Now the reason why I chose F9 is because then we would start getting these starburst effects in some of these lights here. I have a more in-depth video on low light photography and videography that you guys should check out. You can click up here to queue it up. But long exposures are great because it doesn't matter what camera you're using. It could be a phone, APS-C, full frame camera, yada yada yada. You're not pushing your ISO when you set it to 100 and you know how to compensate with your shutter speed or your aperture. It won't give you a noisy photo. So just to show you, this is with the Xperia Pro I and my max aperture is f4. So I just have to compensate with my shutter. But bam, look at that. Look how crazy good the low light photos are off of this phone. Sharp as held to barely any noise. Just wow. Number four, observation decks are my favorite. I love visiting cities, I love skyscrapers, and observation decks are one of the best ways to see the city from above, and probably the safest way to do it too. Now, depending on the country and city, you know, there are a few free observation decks that you can visit, but most that I found, you gotta pay, and it can get pretty pricey. But if you know that you'll get some fire sunset shot that day, it will be worth it. Pro tip, use an anti-reflection lens hood. A lot of observation decks have window panes and glares from indoor light, so these would just help block out the light. I even got one for the Xperia Pro I. Just look how cute it is. Number four, uh, what can I do differently from what already exists out there? So there's a struggle, right? I mean, you do these research, you go out to these places, you might end up getting a lot of the same shots that you saw. So how can you make yourself different? Now, for me personally, usually video gimbal shots are enough to help bring these photos to life. Um, I love now how I can shoot 4K 60 and 120 frames per second on the alpha cameras, and even 4K 120 on the Xperia Pro I. And not a lot of people have tackled this aspect of video creation yet. So in that regards, I do feel a little more unique. But when it comes to photography, it is a little bit harder to try to add your own flair to it, but it's not impossible. Try to shoot from a different angle, and I don't mean going to a different vantage point, but come in at it with your own sort of niche genre of photography. So for example, you know, a lot of the landscape and the cityscape, they're the same, right? But the people who show up are different. So we tend to like to focus on the people that go to these more uh, touristy spots. So I would say try to find your own purpose in photography. Maybe you can be the person that does pet photography at these locations, take photos of the pets that show up at these popular spots, or if there's a certain fashion that you're really into, maybe you can go out and capture the people who have similar fashion tastes to you at these locations and you compile like a book or something. I mean, people have done it before, but if you can find that little niche that you can uh, bring into your own photography, it will help you stand out. 
But here's the thing, at the end of the day, even if I end up getting the same shot as everyone else, if it looks exactly like what I can find off of Google image search, I don't really care, you know? I kind of treat this as a whole Pokemon adventure. I'm going out there catching my own Pokemon. I'm capturing these location just because, you know, it's fun. I'm excited. It gets me out of the house and I'm having a good time. So, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself to try to make things different. So it's no secret that Vivian shoots the videos of me hosting and presenting on the channel. So we will usually have either the A1 or the A7S III as the main camera. And recently we also incorporated the Xperia Pro Eye to our workflow. So if I'm out by myself, I would put on the Pro Eye on top of the camera with the vlog monitor to shoot some BTS. So when it comes to composition, I just pretty much kind of look at what's in the frame. So if there were clouds, I would probably frame more for the clouds and of the skyline. But if there are no clouds like today, I might frame a little bit lower to get more of the ground and the buildings that are underneath the skyline. But if both the ground and the sky doesn't look that great, I would use a telephoto lens to just really hone in on the subject of interest. So I would say that's pretty interesting right there, the two towers with the sun and the clouds. Now obviously with the 24, it's a little bit too wide, so it doesn't look as interesting. But if you put on a telephoto lens, something like a 135, 100 to 400, 2 to 600, that's going to look really nice. Sure, rule of thirds are nice, the diagonal lines are nice, they kind of bring a level of sophistication to your photos. But over the years, I kind of sort of found out that it really doesn't matter as long as what you're presenting in your frame tells a story, tells a message that you want to share. With the advent of social media, a lot of our photos and videos are being viewed on a phone. So that vertical format, that one by one, the four by five, you know, it's just trying to make it look interesting. You know, I think the message and what you're trying to share is far more important than having the right composition. Number six, uh, editing. So for sunrise and sunset photos, I just exaggerate the warmth in my images. That's just a personal preference. But if I'm really stuck on an edit nowadays, what I love about Lightroom Mobile is that now they have a community AI preset that kind of allows you to see what style and color usually goes with a similar photo that you took. And honestly, it really helped me out on a lot of my Paris photos. I was legitimately stuck on the colors and just kind of playing around with the different recommended uh, AI preset. I was able to find a color that I really like for some of my photos. And before that, I would buy other people's presets or use my friends' presets and just kind of go through them one by one on my photos just to see what works. And if I find something that I like, I would study the settings, the sliders, the curves, and reverse engineer just to see what about their settings that I like and how I can tweak my own style to it. And that's the thing, right? Presets are not 100% click and forget. You very much have to make changes to suit your photos. And lastly, number seven, posting on social media or more specifically posting on Instagram. So I often get asked, what are my export settings? And to be honest with you, I just export the full photos as is, no downsizing whatsoever. And it looks great. I haven't had any complaints. In fact, that's why people ask me, you know, what are my export settings? Because it already looks so good. But here's the thing that I learned is to never ever crop within the Instagram app. Don't even bother resizing in the Instagram app. Just make sure you have the correct dimensions before you upload and it should look pretty crisp. And uh, I think that's it for now. If there's anything in specific that you want me to go in details about, let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.